Good evening. We are back with our uh, Wednesday night class. Uh, at, even after we uh, start back on our worship services, we don't know when that will be yet, but even after we start back for a little while, we will have uh, canceled our own Wednesday night services, of course, and so we're just going to continue doing this format for the foreseeable future. Uh, so be apprised of that. Um, Today, uh, Rick is going to be teaching us about uh, types in the Bible. He's continuing that series there, and today we're looking at uh, Canaan as a type for heaven. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Um, yes, and, and I didn't uh, reintroduce uh, the, the notion of types last week, but I, I probably should this week. If you're joining us for the first time, a type is a forecast of sorts. It is an event, is it a person, or it is an institution of some sort in the Old Testament that points to something in the New Testament. In many cases, it is Jesus Christ. Um, the uh, And we've looked at a number of these, a, a, a person, Moses, as a type of Christ, the Levitical priesthood as a type of the priesthood of, of Jesus Christ, uh, the tabernacle that we looked at uh, recently, um, and the, uh, the, the Christ, God dwelling with us, tabernacled here on this earth, and we have a, a tabernacle in heaven not made with hands. We've looked at a number of those um, over the past year or two, and we're getting down toward the end of these lessons. Um, and so uh, this, this one is on Canaan and heaven, uh, two places. Um, if you consider heaven a place, which it is uh, in, in, a, in a sense, but not the same kind of place that the physical Canaan was uh, here on this earth. The interesting thing about those types is, uh, and I don't want to leave it unsaid, is that when God set this system up of, uh, of pointing us to His Son and His Son's time on this earth and His Son's mission and His uh, being, His personality and uh, the church He established, all of those things he definitely wanted to make it clear that what came before was um, a shadow, a copy, not the real thing. And in doing so, he has made that inferior, although it was very important to those people at that time, it was real life to them, it was forecasting something that was far superior that was going to come in the future uh, when Jesus came to this earth and did what he did. So. Uh, types are fascinating. Um, types are a way for God to help us appreciate not only His power and control and authority, but also His understanding of how our mind works. And as we go through these types, we are constantly reminded of His ability and His power to effect these things, put them into effect, but at the same time uh, tweak or, or poke something in our heads that, that He created where we can make these connections. And when we make these connections, when we understand them and, and study them, it enhances our appreciation for everything that He has done for us, and especially uh, the recording of these things so that we can study them in His Scripture. So, with that said, uh, we're going to uh, dive into uh, Canaan and Heaven. Uh, as I usually do, and I, if you don't have a copy uh, of the lesson, they are, uh, where are they located? Now? They're on, uh, they're linked on our Facebook page right underneath this post. You just scroll down and you'll be able to see the link where I linked uh, those. They're on Google Drive technically, but the link's there on Facebook, so you can download those okay. uh, to your computer or look at them on your phone if you want to. And while we're talking about that, uh, our next lesson, uh, which is marriage and Christ and the church, uh, I just sent to Chris before I uh, headed over here to, uh, to Proctorville, and so he will be posting that on there. Uh, we probably will not get to that next week. Uh, this lesson probably will take a couple of, a couple of uh, sessions for us. Um, as I uh, normally do at the beginning of each of these lessons, I tell you straight up something that I referred to back in one of the very early lessons, and it's this fact. Sometimes the scriptures tell us this is a type, flat out. They just say this is a type. Look at it, enjoy it, 
treated as such, appreciated as such. Sometimes uh, it will, and many times, it will not come right out and say, this is a type of this. But the evidence is so strong that we can, can do nothing except uh, accept the fact that it is and was an intended for us to understand as a type. This is one of those that uh, the word type is not used, but it is very clear that this comparison is there and it's there for us to appreciate and understand. And you'll see that as we go through the lesson, the language that is used, the comparisons that are used um, are just a little bit too obvious to, uh, to overlook and not appreciate that God is making this comparison uh, in his word. To, uh, to get us started, uh, if you want to follow along, I I'm going to read a, a portion from Galatians, the sixth chapter. Uh, this is a uh, book by Paul written to the church um, at, at Galatia. And so uh, he is writing to Christians um, about things. Um, he will, from time to time, in a variety of his letters, uh, across several of his letters, refer back to the fact that either they came from Judaism and now they are, are Christians or they came out of paganism and are now Christians. But he is writing to Christians. And keep that in mind as, as, you, as we, we read here. So let's um, start in uh, Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse six. <clears throat> it says, And let the one who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall come shall from the spirit reap eternal life and let us not lose heart in doing good for in due times we shall reap if we do not grow weary and here's where he begins his statement that he uh, finishes up with that ties Canaan to um, the church <clears throat> so then while we have opportunity let us to do good to all men especially to those who are of the household of faith See with what large letters I am writing you with my own hand. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised, simply that they may not um, be persecuted for the cross of Christ. This is one of those references back to Judaism um, when um, people who came out of a pagan background and became a Christian, they were not circumcised. And we have talked about that in previous lessons about how that was the physical sign that God selected so that his people uh, would have this, this physical sign of, of identity with him. And those who, many of those who were Jews who became Christians were hanging on to this old Jewish custom, this old Jewish requirement as a sign that you were one of God's. And Paul and, uh, and others talked about the unnecessary uh, carryover of uh, circumcision into Christianity. It is not a requirement, and he makes that very clear in his writing. And he, he alludes to that here. Some people are still trying to bind that on you. It says, For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, um, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in, in your flesh. We won't go into what all that is, but that's that, that tie that they wanted the new Christians to be circumcised like they were as Jewish Christians. But may it, ever, may it never be that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision anything but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, those who will follow the teachings of Christ and in Christianity, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. <clears throat> now, what does that phrase, the Israel of God, mean? Israel was that nation um, that God uh, blessed, selected, um, chose from 
all the nations on the earth at that time to be his people. He promised them a land. He promised them a, 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 um, a nation. And he promised them the fact that it was from their seed, that special group, that another seed somewhere down the line was going to come that was going to have the capacity to bless all nations of the earth. Now that's a pretty wide blessing, uh, is it not? And it's not only the blessing of the, all the nations of the earth at that time. We know that that seed, Jesus, blessed all nations of all worlds, all people, every individual, by dying for their sins and, and allowing them to restore themselves to God, having separated themselves by their sins from God. But here's what I want to point out. That statement, uh, the Israel of God, um, I don't think is used in this kind of capacity in any other part of the Bible. The Israel of God was that physical Israel, uh, Israelite nation that we read so much about in the Old Testament, especially uh, with regard to Moses and then centuries following that. But when he's talking to us in Galatians, when he's talking to Christians and he says, um, those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God, or comma, the Israel of God. Um, he is referring to us as spiritual Israel. And so uh, in Galatians, right at the end of Galatians, the very last two or three verses, he links us as Christians to Israel. Now, why is that important? Well, we are talking about, and we had a, um, a, a lesson, uh, several series of lessons, a few lessons back. I think when we first started recording these, we were just finishing up that comparison of the people of God, Israel, mm -hmm. people of God, Christians, and um, numerous, numerous comparisons and links and things that we can learn from that relationship. So here, in one verse, in one phrase, Paul pulls those two groups together, Israel and Christians, by calling us, the people he's writing to here, the Israel of God. So we know that um, we have that, that relationship with God that Israel had with them in that physical situation, ours we have in a spiritual. So the comparison is certainly there. Uh, the text says here, uh, the lesson, one of the things we hope to learn from this is that we can have a confident hope of reward. And the uh, scriptures are clear about what that reward is. They're not so clear as to the details of that reward. When, and we'll talk about that when we get back talking about uh, what, what heaven is or is like uh, uh, when we get further back into this lesson. Um, but one thing that is clear, the same conditions that he set up for his people uh, and under the old law are the same conditions that he has for us. Follow me, do my will, I will reward. Do not follow me, go against my will, and I will punish. Um, that seems stark and cold, but that, those, are, those are, I guess, what you would call the legalistic terminology of contracts. Um, a covenant is an agreement. It's a contract. And God has said to his people that I want you in covenant relationship with me. You are the only one that can pull yourself out of that covenant relationship. Don't do that because the reward that is waiting for, awaiting you is well worth being uh, continuing to be faithful. So when we talk about Canaan, that land that was promised um, by God to Abraham and his descendants, um, is, is a definite comparison. That promised land that we have been um, uh, guaranteed if we stay in covenant relationship with God um, parallels out to heaven. Ours is not a physical place on this earth the way theirs was. Ours is a spiritual home and it is for eternity. Any thoughts before we get into the lesson? No, Chris? It's, it's going good. Okay. Uh, Abraham, uh, in 
toward the end of Genesis 11th chapter and certainly the beginning of the 12th chapter of, of Genesis, we are introduced to Abraham. And God, um, Abraham apparently is a, a very righteous person. God comes to him and says, Abraham, uh, gather all your belongings and your family and leave. I will tell you later where you're going. Um, Abraham's faith allowed him to do so. And as he leaves where he is and, and goes, goes up through, uh, up toward Haran and then down through Canaan uh, in, in that middle, uh, middle East area that we know as Palestine, Canaan, uh, that, that area between the Jordan River and uh, the Mediterranean Sea and, and all of that area there. And we'll talk about uh, the extent of that. God pauses in Abraham's journey and says, look about you. All you see here, this land, I will give to your descendants. And so uh, that promise that was made in Genesis, the 12th chapter, uh, was not fulfilled until, um, I guess, the is it the end of, of Exodus? Or I, I think when Joshua finally leads them in, that, that doesn't happen until the beginning of, of Joshua, yeah. uh, the book of Joshua. So we have the exodus from Egypt uh, as a nation uh, that has been in bondage for over 400 years. They go, they get up to uh, Canaan, um, they decide that they can't take it because of the report that comes back, and so God sends them out into the wilderness to wipe out that uh, unfaithful generation there and then allows Joshua, uh, Moses dies, he gets to look in, but doesn't get to go in. And different story there. But uh, Joshua himself leads the people into Canaan and conquers Canaan. So when God makes this uh, promise to him, um, he also says that I will make of you a great nation and uh, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Um, the writing here, and I found this somewhere, I didn't go and count these myself, uh, myself. But it says this this promise or pieces of this promise are repeated uh, at least 55 times with an oath. <clears throat> I will give you this. This is coming to you. It's a sworn statement uh, that God will deliver this. Um, and 12 times it's stated that this oath is an everlasting oath. I would think that any oath God offers uh, wouldn't have to be authorized by saying it's everlasting. God will always come through with his um, share or his side of a covenant agreement, an oath of this sort. And um, then he says, uh, so he doesn't have to say that you know it's everlasting, but it's there for, for emphasis. Joseph, uh, when um, they are... Um, when Joseph is about to die, remember he has brought his brothers, his family, and everybody down, and they live just north of, of, of Egypt where Joseph is. Um, and then uh, Joseph dies eventually, and a Pharaoh not um, familiar with all Joseph has done enslaves the Israelites, and that's how they get into captivity. But as Joseph is about to die, he says, I'm about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land, Egypt, to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So, at least 400 years and then, you know, several generations in between um, when they went down there, um, we have this situation where uh, Joseph, well, just prior to going into um, captivity, Joseph reiterates this this promise that this land was made this promise was made to Abraham and was re-emphasized and reiterated and restated a number of times uh, throughout the Old Testament so this land Canaan was promised by God so it was a physical uh, place where his people would be able to take their rest and prosper and experience the blessings of being in that covenant relationship with God. On the other side, as we have been doing in all of these lessons, we have our spiritual or our comparison, uh, the New Testament comparison, to that which was inferior in the old. <clears throat> 
when we look at heaven, um, we could say that salvation is attached to heaven, eternal life is attached to heaven, and so we could use these, these uh, terms interchangeably if we wanted. But heaven is promised to, as we said a while ago, spiritual Israel, uh, the Christian, the one who responds to uh, the covenant offered by God through obedience to His will and belief in His Son. And so we have a promise, a covenant with God, that if we are faithful, the way the Israelites had been faithful, He rewarded them then, and He will reward us now with, with heaven. Eternal life is the hope of all who uh, have hope in this life, uh, in Christ and in the new covenant. And in reality, uh, which is kind of interesting, um, it was the hope of uh, even those individuals in the Old Testament. Um, we have a, another couple of readings up at the top. Hebrews, the third chapter, talks about how the Israelites uh, blew it, yeah. how the Israelites had Canaan, the promised land, the land of rest, right there in front of them. All they had to do was have enough faith in God who incidentally had demonstrated over and over and over again he had the power to do things that would enable them to conquer anything and anybody. All they had to do was believe in him and move forward and go into Canaan. That didn't take place. Their lack of faith condemned them to not only uh, another 40 years in the wilderness, but it condemned that generation to death without, without entering Canaan. So in the Hebrews, the third chapter, it, it talks about that. And, and he says, um, the writer of Hebrews says in verse 19, and so we see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And then he just carries right on with that same idea in the first few verses of the next one. And I'm gonna read the, these 11 verses because the comparison here is, is, is undeniable. Therefore, let us fear lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, us, heaven, any one of you should seem to come short of it. For indeed we have, the good, have had the good news preached to us, just as they also, God's word was delivered to them, it's been delivered to us, but the word that they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundations of the world. For he has thus said, uh, somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. God rested from his labors, his work in the creation, and he was going to he was determined to have that rest for his people as well, or a similar type of rest uh, from their labors and demonstration of their faith, the same way he has that rest promised for us. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, that would be us, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, them, he again fixes a certain day. Today, saying through David, after so long a time just has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another, another day after that. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's taking us back to Joshua talking about a Sabbath rest that wasn't the rest that he was talking about there, so maybe even then, Joshua had some inkling that there was going to be a Sabbath rest for all of us. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest any one fall through following the same example of disobedience. So, the caution that um, he employs by giving us the example of the Israelites in the Hebrews, the third chapter, the beginning of the fourth here is, they had that rest. It had been promised to them. It was going to be delivered to them. 
their lack of faith kept them from it. And so he says to us the same thing. We have a promised rest. It is guaranteed for us. Let us not do the same thing that the Israelites did. Let us not, because of a lack of faith, be able to uh, not not be able to enter in to that rest. Now that tie that ties rest the idea of rest but to, uh, between these two entities, Israel and uh, our um, our rest in the church. But it's interesting that uh, if you flip over to Hebrews the eleventh chapter, it, it makes some interesting statements about those people, and we have talked about this idea of with types, even said so a while ago, what they were going through in real time. Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice but God, because God directed him to was the momentous, most momentous thing I'm pretty sure Abraham went through in his life. But all God was doing there was, yes, he was testing Abraham's faith and, and giving Abraham the confidence to go forward as well by um, securing the fact that he was faithful and would do whatever God asked of him. But he was also using that to point us, as we studied back during uh, our study on Abraham, the sacrifice of himself giving his son for us to die on this earth for us, for our sins. And so uh, while that was happening in real time to Abraham, these scriptures that we're getting ready to read, uh, getting ready to read, suggest that even Abraham might have, in the back of his mind, or uh, somewhere in there, had a hint that there was more to this life than just what was going on at that time. Um, in Hebrews 11, uh, verses 9 and 10, it's. Uh, we'll start with eight. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place where he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. We talked about that a while ago when God said, Abraham, leave, I'll tell you where you're going to go. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, Canaan, as, and as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he, Abraham, was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham's destination was not a city. Abraham's destination was a place, a city built by God, whose architect and builder is God. Look at verse 13. After he talks about um, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and all of those in verse 13 he says, all these died in faith, meaning they were faithful to what God uh, had required of them, without receiving the promise, but having seen them and then having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They weren't given the benefit of seeing Christ come to this earth to be that final fulfillment of that last promise, the, the seed of all nations being blessed by that seed. Nor were they uh, privy, unless at the time they died that they became privy, uh, to this this city, this place, this uh, abode from a distance that they believed in or had some conviction was going to be this ultimate and final place of rest that um, we talk about here that we are going to experience, but not only us, all those who've been faithful uh, who came before us and all of those who will be faithful in those who come come after us. But there are some interesting uh, passages there, and I believe there are a couple of other allusions uh, to that in the text as well. But even Job talks about the same concept of rest post-death. Yeah. He's outside, <clears throat> outside, outside of Israel, True. living during the same time period probably as Abraham. Even he says, uh, if a man shall die, shall he live again? Yeah. He's kind of like, uh, yeah, I think so. 
Jesus uh, speaks often uh, in his parables of uh, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, he uses a simile there, but he is saying, here's a parable. Here's a story. Here is an event. Here is a, uh, an, uh, an entity like a, a, a pearl of great value or something, something like that that he uses to say the kingdom of heaven is like this and it has these characteristics, these features. When Jesus does that, he is talking, and I think our scriptures would bear that out, that, that the kingdom of heaven has, has two possible meanings. In the lesson I say this, we know this phrase has two meanings. The first way he uses this as a synonym for the church. Uh, John the Baptist uh, said uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand or is coming soon is right around the corner. Jesus could be a, a, a metaphor of that kingdom, but the church was established, and we'll, we'll make some more comments about that in just a minute, that the, these two uh, words, the kingdom and the church, are, are interchangeable. The second way that the uh, phrase kingdom of heaven is um, used is to be not that, that physical entity or a physical slash spiritual entity here on earth, but the kingdom of heaven that is heaven in and of itself. And so um, just know that, the, that, that, uh, that phrase kingdom of heaven can be used in more than one way. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Chris. I asked him to uh, to look at this. Uh, he and I are in agreement on this, and and so uh, I, this is not going to be a debate where I'm setting him up and I'm going to start attacking his arguments. Um, but let me just set it up this way: in Matthew the 16th chapter, uh, Jesus asked, um, "Who do others say that I am?" And um, one of them says, "Oh, some say John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets." And so Jesus gets real direct with them and says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter, um, one who never shrinks from uh, you know, stepping up and, and saying what's on his <clears throat> mind, uh, as it is on his mind, uh, says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Jesus goes on to explain some things about that statement that I believe uh, are commonly misinterpreted by uh, many people. And I believe I've even heard uh, people in the church say that Peter uh, is being selected here by how Jesus responds to this for some special kind of position or, or title or something of this sort. Chris is going to explain <laughs> to you why that's not the case. Okay, so uh, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, I would highly recommend an app for you. It's called the Blue Letter Bible, um, but it will let you, uh, it, ha it has uh, in its programming an interlinear Bible. Interlinear Bibles are helpful because they have the Greek text on this line and the English equivalent up, up above it. Um, this one's particularly helpful in the Blue Letter Bible app because you can click on the word and it will take you to what this word means. So. I have an interlinear Bible, so I looked up this passage. It's Matthew chapter 16, uh, starting in around verse 16, but we're going to be looking in verse 18. So I looked that up in my interlinear Bible just to kind of look at the terms to remind myself of what these terms, what these words looked like, and maybe some of the um, uh, the gender, because Greek has different genders in it, like Spanish or French. Uh, you can tell what word is in which gender. Um, by the way, it ends. So Greek is 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 like that too. And if you didn't know that uh, words had genders, that's a new that's a revelation to you as well. There, there are girl it? words and boy words, yeah. and there are neutral and there are neutral words, words <laughs> as well. Um, are you going to read the passage to them? Just yeah, go, so ahead, have, go ahead and read it. Okay. I, don't, I don't have it. All right, Matthew Matthew sixteen. You want eighteen through what twenty? Uh, yeah, that'll be perfect. Eighteen, nineteen. Yeah, that'll be good. Okay. Um, okay, I'll just go back to seventeen. Peter says. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 16, Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. 
and whatsoever and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, so when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Peter kind of gets emphatic. Uh, there's a way to show emphasis in Greek, and Peter uses that where he says, you are the Christ. Um, and he goes on to say the other stuff that he says, but he says emphatically, you are the Christ. So you kind of see Peter pointing at Jesus excitedly saying, you, you're him, you're the Christ. And then Jesus turns right back around on Peter and kind of points in my mind. I see him pointing back at Peter saying, and you are Peter. He uses the word, I don't know if you can see this or not, but he uses the word Petros. It's Peter's name. At least it's the nickname that Jesus gave Peter. And it means rock or stone. And a lot of times we've said, you know, he's trying to call out of Peter this idea of immovability because Peter's so wishy-washy and able to be moved by the winds and different decisions and different things. And Jesus wanted him to be solid. Um, that word, Petros, is masculine. It is Peter's name. Uh, later on in the passage, uh, after Jesus says, you're Peter and on this rock, remember Peter means rock, um, but he uses a different term there. He's not going to use Petros. Uh, he uses Petra. And so he's using two different terms. When he talks to Peter, he says, your name is Petrus. Uh, Petros, sorry. <laughs> he, your name is Petros. You're Peter, uh, meaning rock. But on this, this rock, uh, Petra, which is a, a feminine term, uh, I'm going to build my church. And it would have been very easy for him to say, you are Peter, and upon Peter, I'm going to build my church, if that's what he was intending. That's not what he was intending. That's not what he said. He uses a different word entirely, and Chris is going to explain to you the difference between that rock and this rock. So a lot of times I think people struggle on this one because uh, they've, they've come up against this idea of a cornerstone. Uh, and we, come, we, we talk about that quite a bit, right, where Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. Uh, don't see Jesus as the cornerstone. That's a different passage. Don't read that into this passage. What Jesus is talking about here, the, the foundation that he's going to build his church on, is, is the thing that's underneath the building. It's not the cornerstone. It's the, it's the foundation that's underneath the cornerstone. So think of, uh, think of more like this, um, a cliff face. Um, so let's get to that in just a second. If you've been driving down to Ashland lady, lately, uh, you've seen the, 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 they're blasting off the side of the hill, uh, and you see stones, even good-sized boulders, you know, um, that you couldn't fit in your car, because I think Kelly would try to. <laughs> uh, but these massive rocks that, that they've blown off the side of the hill, uh, to Jesus, those would be Petro, uh, Petroses. Those would be Peters. Those would be rocks. Uh, it's the same word he uses, a Petros. Um, whether they're small or whether they're huge, to Jesus, they're a piece of the whole. Um, they are not the whole, but they are a section of, a piece of, um, the cliff. And so he would say, they'd say, Petros. That's a, that's a rock, that's a stone. That's not what Jesus said he was going to build his church on. When he was talking about building his church, he's saying, I'm going to build my church on the cliff face, on the foundational, the bedrock. Um, he uses different terms there when he talks about what he's going to build his church on. He certainly could have said, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter, Petros. But he did not. He said, I'm going to build my church on the Petra, this feminine word that means a cliff, which makes a whole lot of sense because most likely they're in the area of Caesarea Philippi. Um, and this area, if I had a better picture of, her, picture of it, looks a whole lot more like this cliff face than just a bunch of rocks. Uh, you can see the buildings... Um, in my picture here that are that are built on the cliff face uh, in this area. And so it makes a lot of sense to me uh, the way I read this in Greek, and I think I think I'm reading it correctly from all the things that I've studied, all the different linguists that I've uh, consulted here. Jesus says something very much like this: "You are Peter, but on this bedrock foundational principle that you just espoused, that I am the Christ, that's what I'm going to build my church on. 
It starts to make a whole lot of sense uh, when he does that because he uses this exact same word earlier when he's talking about, um, in Matthew chapter 7, what the wise man builds his house on. He goes back and says the wise man builds his house on the, on the rock, on the cliff face. He uses the same word, Petra. Um, it's the exact same word he uses there, but the wise man's going to build his house on that firm foundation. The foundation, incidentally, if you go back and look at Matthew chapter 7, that is Jesus' words, not Peter's. Um, what Peter says here is incredibly insightful. It's correct. It's revealed to him by God. It's revealed man. to him, right? It's a divine revelation. Um, so <clears throat> nothing against what Peter says there at all, obviously, of course, but that Peter is not what Jesus is going to build his church on. In fact, what Jesus is going to build his church on is this bedrock principle that Peter is talking about, that Jesus is God. And it's interesting, this passage shows that uh, Jesus has a, a sense of humor, not that we didn't know uh, beforehand, because what he does there, he takes the word uh, rock for Peter's name, the Petros, and then turns it around and uses it in another fashion for another word and another different type of rock. You are Peter, or rock, but this rock is the one that's important. This rock of I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is that rock, that foundation, that truth, that, that fact on which God will build or I will build my church. Um, and, that, and that reality is the foundation yeah. of the church. Without that reality, there is no church. Uh, there is, <laughs> we throw out a bunch of the Bible, uh, especially the New Testament. And so uh, Jesus is, is, is making a point here. And, and, what, and we'll go on and talk about what he says next uh, about that. But he is making a point here that, yes, that confession, that profession, that statement, that assertion by Paul, by Peter here, is that which provides the foundation of everything else that's going to happen. It's without that, none of that rest of that that is supposed to happen will happen. If <laughs> Peter says, I think in another place, or I think it's Paul, if Christ be not raised, I'm an idiot. Yeah, first I'm a fool. 15. I'm a fool. I am out here sacrificing my life on a daily basis for the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he was the Son of God. And if that didn't happen, none of this is going to happen. And so uh, that, that foundation, that he is the Son of God um, and uh, the Son of the living God uh, and the Christ, the Messiah, without that, uh, our faith is, is nothing. It, it has no foundation if, that does, if it doesn't have that foundation. That confession, as I say here in the lesson by Peter, is that rock. Um, on which Jesus says he will build his church and against which not even the gates of Hades will prevail. Um, so uh, we are all condemned because of our uh, separating ourselves from God through our sins. Jesus is the only one who can prevail against the gates of Hades uh, that will obviously swallow us without him. And then he says this, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, um, and whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Um, in other words, he is giving someone here the authority to carry on what he has begun by speaking directly for God. Jesus says, I say nothing that isn't given me by the Father. I do his will. I carry out his will. These words are not my own. They're my Father's uh, in heaven. And so when Jesus knows that, that very shortly he is going to be leaving, and he is, uh, I guess you could say christening, he is, uh, uh, what do you do that, uh, sanctifying, blessing, whatever he is, he is anointing. That's the uh -huh. word I was looking for. He is anointing the apostles, if not at this point, he will uh, within a few chapters or a few uh, upcoming days here 
with the power to do exactly what he did, speak for the Father. And he says, whatever you say, when you are being led by the Holy Spirit, is going to be bound in heaven because it's going to come from heaven. Whatever you loose is going to be loosed in heaven. It will be truth. It will be fact. It will happen because that inspiration is coming directly from heaven. Now the question is, is he still pointing a finger at Peter? Right. Or has he taken a step back and looked at all of the apostles? Um, if Peter wasn't the one on whom the foundation uh, of his church was going to be established, but it was on his confession there, then I don't think that we can point to Peter and say Peter had any greater revelation than any of the other apostles. Uh, Paul says, I'm not inferior to any of the apostles. Yeah. So if Paul was speaking truth there, he wasn't inferior to Peter. Peter is not in this passage, and don't let anyone ever tell you that he is, being singled out as being special for anything. He was the first to speak. He spoke absolute truth. Jesus took that truth and, and, and built upon it and then turned right around and said to all of the apostles, you all are going to have the authority that I have on this earth to speak for the Father through direct inspiration. And so uh, this happens. The next section there says Acts 2 is the fulfillment of that prophecy uh, and promise that Jesus makes. The apostles in uh, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4, are filled with the Spirit. They miraculously, which is a strong demonstration of authority from heaven, speak languages unknown to them but heard and understood uh, by the people in attendance. And, you know, how, how this happened, I can't tell you. I don't know if they miraculously knew the language and spoke and then the people heard their, as, as, you, as you would for a translator uh, speaking, or whether they spoke and somehow in the air or in the heads of the people they got translated, but, but they were fully aware of what was going on there. The people said, how is it that we're hearing these people in our own language? Are they drunk? <laughs> Which seems is an like, odd conclusion. It seems like an illogical <laughs> conclusion. Isn't yeah. Uh, just being drunk doesn't allow you to speak in a language uh, that you're not familiar with. Um, and then they came to the, uh, another uh, conclusion about that. Well, it's only the third hour of the day. Hey, they, can't be, they can't be that drunk. Well, they could. They started early <laughs> enough. Uh, but but the, point, the point is this. Uh, they demonstrated their ability to do exactly what Jesus said they were going to be able to do. By that authority, you are going to have the keys to the kingdom. The words that will open people's minds to admission into the kingdom. Admission into the church. Their message, and as another situation, which is kind of a bugaboo of mine. People say that Peter, uh, on the first day, you know, was, uh, was the one who delivered the sermon. Yes, he was. His words are recorded, but if you read closely up above it, it says that all the other eleven also were doing the same thing. Peter wasn't speaking to all these people and speaking all of these different languages. There were eleven other people around the, the porticos of the temple at that time who were speaking to people from all those different places, they say, uh, the people were gathered there at that time. So uh, they were doing this. Their message, in Peter's words, were, you've crucified the Son of God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And we find out in verses 38 and 39 that because they obeyed that command and responded to it, that they were added to the church. Oh, that's the other thing. Um, in that passage in Matthew 16, uh, he says, "I will on this rock I will build my church. And then the very next verse it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, the keys to that church, to admission to that church. Um, and those terms are, are uh, interchangeable there. And so when it says they were added to the church in Acts 2, 38 and 39, they were added to the kingdom. They were admitted 
to the kingdom. Um, in oh, it says in four in verse forty forty one forty two, and forty seven. So um, we also have one other place where these two words are are interchanged. Um, back to Hebrews, uh, the the twelfth chapter. It says this. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read down. I think I I didn't decide where to start there. Let's start at 18, um, Hebrews 12th chapter, verse 18. He's been talking um, about uh, Jesus as our example at the beginning of 12. He's just concluded his uh, listing of all of those who were faithful under uh, previous dispensations and not ever and he, here's here's uh, one of those other verses in, in 11 39 and 40 it says all these things all of these individuals having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised they never saw Christ coming in the flesh because God has provided something better for us so that apart from them they should not be made perfect we're not special our time is special. Christ has come during that time period he was writing here and has delivered all of those promises that that were made to those people but they never really got to see. He's been talking about that and then he uh, then he goes um, over in verse 18 of chapter 12 he says for you have not come to a mountain that may be touched and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom, and a whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word should be spoken to them. He's alluding to the time period when uh, God was speaking to Moses. God was delivering to Moses uh, his will for the people, his law, and they could not go near the mountain that Moses was up on because if they touched it, they would die. Even I think even coming close uh, was, was dangerous for them. And they, when Moses, when Moses came down, they said, "You deal with God. You can handle that. We can't." It was fearful for them to even be near uh, the presence of God. For if they could not bear the command, even if a beast touches a mountain, they will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, "I am full of fear and trembling." But he says this. He's writing to Christians once again. Hebrews, Jews, by and large, who have become Christians. But you have come to Mount, not Sinai, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So what he's saying is, you Christians have come to a mountain. That mountain is not Jerusalem, it's not Sinai. You've come to spiritual Jerusalem. You have come to the mount that all of us will ascend one day and and live forever after to li to in, enjoy the joys uh, of heaven and it says in verse 28 therefore since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken like earthly kingdoms can let us show gratitude by which we may offer to god an acceptable servants service with reverence and awe for our god is a consuming fire so this idea that um, we have heaven as our promised land, our promised place of eternal rest was set up for us by giving the land of Canaan to the Israelites by God a physical resting place for those people. So as we move on through here, uh, next we're going to look at uh, conditions for entering and uh, that it can be lost um, even once entered. 
says here, and we'll conclude with this, and as Chris has some uh, comments, as obedient Christians, we have entered the earthly kingdom of God, the church, which is that initial uh, entry point while we are alive here on this earth. When we die, uh, um, and on day of judgment, and when and however all that takes place, we will live in uh, heaven with God in eternity. While at the same time, our names have been enrolled in the heavenly kingdom, the church and the kingdom are one. But there are two kingdoms. The church here on this earth, the, the body, the collection of all of those who are saved, and those individuals will enjoy eternal rest uh, in heaven. Maybe a helpful way to think about it would be those concentric circles you see sometimes with things that overlap. So like when you see kingdom in Scripture, uh, sometimes it's talking about the church, right? Uh, even in the Old Testament, you know, Daniel talks about the church. Uh, Isaiah talks about the church a variety of different times. But when you see kingdom in Scripture, sometimes it's talking about the church. Sometimes it's talking about heaven, yeah. um, which makes sense because one day the church will be transported to heaven. Right? They, will, they will become one and there will be no more two yeah. different entities. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you can make a pretty pretty strong argument, I feel like, that this is, is one entity with maybe two parts or something. I don't, I don't know how to explain that. It's bilateral unity. Yeah. <laughs> but... It, 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 maybe we can look at it in a stages type situation. Heaven has uh, has existed since God has created man and, and uh, uh, allowed a place for him to ultimately be with him for eternity. But the church has been only in a, a period of time. The church was not established until Jesus came, gave himself for it, and established on, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after um, uh, Passover there. And so from that day forward, the church on earth has, has existed. But that group, as Chris says, any member of that who dies in faith automatically moves out of that church, which is a, which is a physical, and there is a spiritual component to it as well, uh, on this earth, but now has moved on to uh, that, that heavenly kingdom uh, or that heavenly heavenly. And, and really all church means is, is, is a collective, an assembly. Um, and it, we talk about the, the called out mm -hmm. uh, aspect of the Greek word. But uh, church is a group. Church here on this earth is a group of believers who have done what they need to do to enter that body of believers. They will be rewarded one day if they die in faith. And so uh, it is our goal and should be the goal of everyone who has entered that that body, to remain in that body, to remain faithful until death, so that your effort will not have been wasted like it was for the Israelites who got up to their heaven, Canaan, and lost their faith that God could deliver them. So uh, that warning in Hebrews 3 and 4 uh, is graphic and it's severe. But it's real. Don't blow it. Don't blow the opportunity you have and have set yourself up for by rendering obedience to God through falling away and disobedience. And Hebrews in three or four different places says, don't go back. Don't lose that which you have obtained. It's a very strong message in, in Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Uh, so next week, we'll be going through the second half of this lesson. Yep. Uh, you can download the notes. Again, uh, it, it'll be the last post I made right before we went live on this one. Um, so you can download the notes there. Join us Sunday mornings at uh, 10 o'clock right here on Facebook, on YouTube. Or if you have friends that hate technology, you can get on a, on a phone and call 304-278-0763. Uh, and get the uh, get the worship service uh, like that. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you next week. <laughs>